decenter to give power to polycenters. Move from your center to my center. Move from Europeanistic in Western center. Experience how polycenter inform each other in your body. My name is Tove Rodmark. I have been practicing, performing, and teaching hip hop and house for many years. Although the Europeanistic aesthetics has naturally been a big part of my education here in Sweden. When being a student in the master program of contemporary dance didactics, the styles and techniques of hip hop and house was always the basis for my curiosity about the dancing body and its pedagogies. Partly because there was so much more to discover within the styles and how to theorize and perform them in my context. Now moving toward questions on how to decentralize my own body and those reproductions of power systems that I produce and bring with me. To criticize my own actions within the system can put forward new knowledge about appropriation or cultural arrogation. For example, my master thesis was about polycentrism in contemporary hip hop, sociopolitical and aesthetic movements in dance. This thesis became an act of naming some of the aesthetics that had been hiding in my body in practice. Together with 11 dancers, I investigated artistic methods by using the Africanist aesthetic of polycentrism. Maybe polycentrism as an aesthetic in dance also can be used as a way to decentralize norms in dance in this Swedish context, a context which I believe still works within a power system where the Western aesthetics still have a central governance in comparison to other aesthetic traditions. I will now give you a personal round tour in a room that, to me, represents dance education and tradition in Sweden, a dance studio. This guide will give you a sense of being in my body or shoes in between aesthetic everyday choices. The text that I read will be both from my master thesis, some quotes, but I will also share some anecdotes from my own experiences that, that I felt like sharing with you today. The brook finds its way around the stones that form its flowing. If all dance is cultural expression and specific ways of relating to people and the world, then dance can help to understand cultural differences. My name is Ingrid Redback Valand, and I worked with the master program Contemporary Dance Education. 2013 to until 2021. And has since the start been thinking of how to change ideas and the practice of dance and dance education. Today I will bring up two strategies that I worked out in an attempt to decolonize dance practice here called inclusion and dialogue. Part one. Inclusion through audition. The students' experiences of dance and movement practices. Argentine's tango, ballet, contemporary dance, creative dance, Feldenkrais, improvisation, jazz dance, line dancing, physical theater, street dance, screen dance, Swedish folk dance. The students' teaching experiences, dance for children and youth, dance for different able persons, dance in school, dance at upper secondary school, dance at university, 
dance as professional education, dance for professionals. The students' backgrounds, different ages, 27 on to 60, different level of education, education as a dancer, or BA in dance, dance pedagogy. Different professional roles, choreographer, dancer, dance developer, teacher. My name is Anna Björk and I'm a dancer and dance teacher. I'm also a dance archivist at the Swedish Performing Arts Agency. I graduated from the master program of contemporary dance education last year with my master thesis, The Folk Dancer and the Archive, an investigation of tradition bearing as critical archive practice. I looked at the dancer's encounter with archive at what is done in the situation of knowledge transmission from one dancer to another both from now living dancers understood as archives and from dancers represented in text photographies and films. I wanted to understand these situations theoretically and for this I used archive theory. I won't say so much more about my study but rather give you a small glimpse into the theoretical framework that I used for my thesis since I think this is interesting when it comes to decolonization. Within archive studies, there is no consistent understanding of the concept of archive. Depending on context and geographical location, there are different traditions and definitions. However, the last 20 years, there has been a development towards a more democratic and inclusive understanding of archive and archive practices. Important impulses for these changes came from postmodern and postcolonial theory, feminist theory, human rights research, and indigenous studies. This branch within archive theory is, for example, described as critical or pluralizing, and opens up for increased democratization, participation, and decentralization in archive practices. It raises questions like, what and who could be considered being an archive? What and who is chosen to be in the archive? What kind of knowledge is considered valuable? What is chosen not to be in the archive? What do we actually choose to forget? Who decides? Who performs the process of valuing, labeling, and making descriptions in the archive? Essential for my study was that this pluralizing approach to the archive opens to an understanding of the body, the memory, the dance space as archive, and it also acknowledges affective aspects of archive practice. The body as archive is today, as we know, a well-known idea also within performance studies. But within archive studies, I found some critical perspectives that suited my study and my dance genre. One of the most central concepts within archive theory is record which is, let's say, the carrier of information that serves as a reminder of facts or an earlier event. Shannon Forkhead, who is researching indigenous archive practices in Australia, defines the record as any account, regardless of form, that preserves memory or knowledge of facts and events. A record can be a document, an individual's memory, an image, or a recording. It can also be an actual, an actual person, a community, or the land itself. Sue so McCamish, also from Australia, says, record-keeping traditions in Aboriginal Australia are many, many thousands of years old and take many forms. They are transmitted and accessed through storytelling and performance using speech, dance, art, music, and song. This kind of record or archive requires time and effort in building respect and relationship for one to gain access to the archive. 
unlike the archive institution with a fixed address and certain opening hours. I mentioned before that this branch within archive theory acknowledges effect, affective reactions and relations within the archive. Archive scholars Michel Caswell and Marika Seifer also introduces the concept of radical empathy in the archive. Whereas empathy is the capacity to imagine the inner experiences of another person, emp empathy becomes radical when it is practiced even when conflicting emotions arise in interaction with other so-called stakeholders in the archive. They also suggest that radical empathy is not about sensing the other unconditionally, but instead being aware of the differences between oneself and the other, not losing oneself, but staying in relation. In this sense, radical empathy provides space for differences and friction, and thus invites to relationship and negotiation. I found archive theory useful for analyzing the complex interactions between dancing bodies in knowledge transmission situations. Not only for understanding how the dance tradition and dance technique were transmit transmitted, but also for insights about how layers of knowledge interacted and were negotiated. How frictions between different approaches caused established understandings and perspectives to be set in motion. To, to make hierarchies visible and to value the marginalized in the archive and thus influence uh, future archive practices. My name is Ami Skånberg Dahlstedt. I am the current head of the master program, Master in Contemporary Dance Education at Stockholm University of the Arts. I grew up in Sweden, in Gothenburg's northeastern part. The first dance training I met was Croatian folk dance. However, this was never counted as professional dance practice. Later in my vocational dance education at Ballet Academy, I studied Revelations by Alvin Ailey with Anna Grip and Kenneth Gustafsson. However, it did not really count at that time. Everyone had to be on point, and that is literally uh, in point use every day. I have worked with and studied Nihon Buyo, traditional Japanese dance, in Kyoto since 20 years. Being a student of Nihon Buyo, I teach the class like my teacher Nishikawa Senrei did, and I do not conform it to a Western situation. But I do teach deconstruction of movements, the way it is done in so-called postmodern dance techniques. However, it is based on Nishikawa Senrei's focus on suriyashi, a gendered walking technique. Putting my studies in Japanese dance in Kyoto at the center as a way to defy the ethnocentrism in Western dance scholarship has worked as a way to decolonize traditional thinking in dance pedagogy. I do not leave out the reflection on how Japanese dancers have suffered first because of an actual banning of women from stage in the 17th century, and second, how the Meiji government in 1868 imported an educational system based on European models where Western dance cultures were being introduced. For the new Japanese nation state, cultural practices were re-examined to fit modern times, where the Western was constructed as modern. Orientalist discourses have posited Asian dance forms as products of isolated national cultures, separate from and irrelevant to global dance history. Therefore, Asian dancers have been presented either as objects of representation or bearers of fixed ancient tradition. Nishikawa Senrei was a well-known innovative 
Japanese choreographer, dancer and artist, who created her own scripts, choreographies and set design and toured the world. However, as Japanese dance was then practiced outside the modernized westernized school system in Japan, it became something only for the cultural elite, the upper classes running traditional companies. This was something that my teacher Nishikawa Senrei resisted, trying to welcome students from different backgrounds. However, the story about dance in Sweden is also that it has been kept out from the school system and taught privately. Thus, it has not been something for each and everyone until very recent. Growing up in Sweden, I learned Croatian folk dances from the children of refugees fleeing war in search of liberation. Here, dancing allowed a negotiation of the transition between the traditions of a home nation and the modernity of the new nation. Thus, I learned Croatian nationalism through the body. Dances and songs praising traditional values and the defending of violence. Digi sedi ji naro de moi pravda te zove o curva vi boy. And as beautiful as this song is, it asks for bloodshed. I will now give you a personal round tour in a room that to me represents dance education and tradition in Sweden, a dance studio. This guide will give you a sense of being in my body or shoes in between aesthetic everyday choices. The text that I read will be both from my master thesis, some quotes, but I will also share some anecdotes from my own experiences that I felt like sharing with you today. Welcome to the dance studio. Now put on your sneakers. Feel how the soul meets the floor when you move. Rubber meets rubber. What does it feel? Is it sticky? Is it comfortable? Can you spin and glide along the floor? How do your feet move within your sneaker? How does it sound? What does the floor do with your movements in the rest of your body? Participants describe that the power of monocentrism felt like a firework where the power is largest and thickest in the center and then become weaker and thinner further out. Participants also noted that it's so interesting. What is a monocenter really? I get provoked. If this is the center you have worked for at this school for three years without, this is no fucking center, okay? In ballet and modern, but damn not in anything else. I get provoked. I feel death. I feel flat, okay? It can be nice too. Now sprinkle some baby powder and rub the sole of your shoe in the powder. Then dance. How does it feel? What does the baby powder do to your movements? Participants described, I think I feel that everything belongs together in a holistic way. It never gets particularly isolated, but the movement constantly travels further, at least for me, that there may be a stop, but that that stop always retains the ten tension, which is then the nicest thing about it though, so that you do not lose energy, I mean. 
but to think, as you said, more wholeheartedly than the center of that center. Now see yourself in the mirror while you dance. How does it feel? What do you see? Who do you meet in the mirror? You, your teacher, your fellow dancers in the room. How do you interact with them? Participants described, what I thought about most was how I use polycentrism when I dance, that I've done it all this time without knowing it. And I remember when I was a student at the candidate program in dance pedagogy at DOC between 2010 and 2013, we had dance didactics with several different teachers that were experts in jazz, folk dance, or any other dance form, but not really in hip hop. I remember that we created methods, pedagogies and didactics through our practice, but there were little theories that we could anchor our practice through. The approach was kind of like we were the first hip hop dancers that were going through this kind of education. Being innovative and creating artistic methods through practice is a good way of creating knowledge. But everything you do always has a connection to traditions and knowledge that comes from someone else before you. The didactics and pedagogies have been there long before us. And I think it is ignorant to believe otherwise. Now remove the mirror by closing the curtain and turn off the regular light. Maybe put on the disco lightning and dance. How does it feel? What do you see? Who do you meet in the room? You, your teacher, your fellow dancers in the room? How do you interact with them? Participants described, freestyle has a completely different structure in that it is very polycentric compared to a monocentric philosophy. I remember so many dance situations in my body. And here I shared two things that I believe have an impact on how dancers relate to the room, themselves and others. The example of the floor comes from my experience of having to adapt to a room of Western aesthetic by showing you how we compromise and adapt to different floors. It is nothing special about that experience, but we can look at it from different polycenters or perspectives. The other example is from me teaching freestyle to my students. They often reflect on and always want to know how their dancing looks like, both when dancing with facing the mirror and turned away from it. It says something about the aesthetic of the room and how the dancer relates to that aesthetic. Freestyle as an artistic and choreographic practice does not really need mirrors. It is more often described as an connection between the individual and the community, the relation between bodies. The aesthetics of polycentrism circulate through our bodies with artistic potential to create relations between polycenters inside and outside the body. Polycentrism can highlight relationships between aesthetics, contexts as a social phenomenon in process, non-linear. Part two, inclusion and dialogue in the education. If inclusion is about representation, equating all forms of dance and experiences, and thus a question hierarchical structures, how do we practice that? The common thread of the education is the students' experiences. Their own practice is centered and inclusion means that all assignments are based on it. Despite all the good intentions, how inclusive are we? Are all students' experiences included? 
What does it mean that education is at an art university? A context where art is often separated from and valued higher than pedagogy, and that the contemporary dance genre is valued higher than all other dance genres. What I have repeatedly struggled with is how we should work inclusively in the dance studio. When students have such different experiences, we should I choose not to reproduce hierarchies? In the first years, I solved the problem by usually avoiding being in the dance studio to instead spend the time together with the students, developing a critical approach in the theory room. Later on in the dance studio, I tried improvisation, which in our context has been regarded as something neutral and not genre bound. The problem is that it clashes with genres such as street dance or folk dance, which have improvisation as an integral part of their dance practice, which is something completely different. Sometimes I've solved the dance studio problem by allowing students to meet dances that no one has as an expert area, such as when an employee in the department had Egyptian dance as a special area. Maybe there is no solution to the problem, but more about how we talk on and discuss what happens in the dance studio than what is actually done. Or... The dialogical approach that meets the education is inspired by Homi Baba's theory, third space. When I apply it to education, I imagine his first space at the individual level. It is the dance that the students danced during their upbringing and that becomes part of their identity. Second space instead are structures which open or close for the students' dance. Examples of structure are colonialism and education. Third space, on the other hand, is the area where it's possible for students to form a space for their own dance within the structure. For some of the students, there are no conflicts between first and second space as their dance is well accepted. They are in the center of the norms. But that does not apply to everyone. In the artistic context that this university constitutes, above all, dances that are more social, collective expressions become foreign. If the education is to function as a third space where different types of dance are treated equally, a dialogue must arise that makes the participants aware of the differences. How do we practice it? In each course, students are divided into what I call collegial groups, usually about two to three people with as different experiences as possible. The tasks are about reading, discussing, and summarizing text, but also critically discuss each other's practice-based tasks. In the groups, the practice of dialogical approach by listening to and respecting the other and treating each other as equals. If the participants in a group have too much of the same experiences, I'll notice that they have a hard time discovering what is taken for granted. The differences do not become sufficiently prominent, but they confirm the norm instead of critical examining it. Differences are therefore a prerequisite for their dialogue to contribute to decolonizing hierarchies and norms in the dance area. This does not mean that the hierarchies disappear, but by being visible, they can be decentralized. The book finds its way around the stones that form its flowing.
Inspired by questions raised by archive theory, I would like to invite you to a guided tour within your own inner archive. If you like to take part, please try to recall a dance experience that, in this case, involves an encounter with another dancer. You are welcome to close your eyes. Maybe it's a dance partner, a teacher or a choreographer. Someone that you have been dancing with during a short or longer period of time, or maybe just once. Somebody that in some way has left an imprint in you as a dancer. It can be an encounter that has been inspiring and teaching, or that has provoked you, or maybe both. A memory of a dance experience that was important to you and that has been stored in your body and your memory. What do you remember of the encounter with this person? What was the situation? What has this meant to you? If you have some space to move where you are right now, you can remind yourself of movements that were performed or that happened in the situation of your memory. Remembering this, what happens in your body? Which physical sensations arise? Feelings? Do you get an impulse to do something, to move in a certain way? Be in this memory through your physical body. What imprint have this encounter actually made in you and your dancing? What is still present in you today? Was there anything in the situation with the dancer in your memory that caused an experience of friction? Were there opinions that you didn't agree with? Values that did not match yours? Maybe approaches to dancing, to the body, or traditions within your dance genre that didn't match your own values? How did you deal with this back then? How did you relate to the differences? And how does it feel in your body today when you remind yourself of this? How is the dancer of your memory being valued? Who expresses that and how? How are you yourself being valued as a dancer? How do you value yourself in relation to the person of your memory? How is your dance genre being valued in relation to other genres? Who decides? Can we, by creating awareness or a discussion about this, set old hierarchies in motion? Or who has the power to do this? As we now consider you being an archive, which contains a lot of experience, knowledge, memories, including the situation you just reminded yourself of, how much of this knowledge is accessible to others? What would you choose to share with others? To whom? What conditions would you require? What do you not want to share with others? What do you need to keep to yourself? Consider this, inspired by words like integrity, respect, generosity, privacy, knowledge transmission and figure out what applies to this particular particular archive to you right now. The other thing I do in order to decolonize traditional thinking in dance pedagogy is to teach dance history. 
and reflect on dance as a statement of authority, often seeks to align itself with dominant models of power. I include reflections on how some movements created for the good of the people instead proved very violent. First, let us experience part of dance history and watch this video. We are watching a part from Mary Wigman's Exodus. It was captured for the 1925 film Wege zu Kraft und Schönheit, The Way to Power and Beauty. Mary Wigman and dancers portray a migration. The Jewish people escaping slavery, walking for liberation. It is difficult to watch the dance piece Exodus today, knowing that Jewish dancers were not protected by the German government during the Nazi regime. Wigman and dancers walking in nature in the time slot between the two world wars also represent violence. Wigman and dancers walking in nature shows a kinship with what was at stake in early modernism, the more fluent natural movement language, popularized by Isidore Duncan. And as lovely as the pastoral spirit of Romanticism seems, we know today that dancing freely in nature does not only represent freedom, it also represents essentialist views of who is good and bad, and who has the right to move freely and liberated in society. By revisiting and writing letters to history, to sculptures and paintings of nameless dancers, I help myself and my students to decolonize from a domination of systems, from a particular way of moving that has been approved by authorities and still prevent everyone from feeling safe in a dance class. A strategy for decolonizing is to declare dance pedagogy all but innocent. Understanding that dance can take part and engage in democratic movements in society, in politics, the aesthetics need to change and welcome further perspectives. I spend more time now allowing space for reflection of movements in space, like the Japanese walk Suryashi, and how movements affect space. Investigating how dance could be a way to experience space together and the critical reflection on how we create space in dance and in society. This is Jorios Jotokos, who was my master's student at Academy of Music and Drama in Gothenburg. After a full day of practicing Suryashi together in urban space, I asked the master students to document and write their own reflections on Suryashi and on space. Yorios tied his written reflection around one foot and walked slowly in Suryashi while documenting. The text unfolded and became like a long trail behind him. I was very touched by his and the other students' performative responses. In other academic disciplines, teachers discuss reading and course literature and how students should be encouraged to read. Inviting dance to the university, we work hard to weave practice and theory and defend other ways of reading and writing spaces, of discussing and being together. It created a point of contact between teacher and student Perhaps it was an in-between space, but there was surprise, wonder and reverence and respect for each student's individual practice and reflection. <laughs>